welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. We're super excited to actually be doing something live for once. It's not in person. In-person events are coming. I'm super excited for those. And uh, I know we're all planning what our spring and summer and, and fall uh, event circuit's going to look like. But with us today, we have uh, Richard Robbins. Some of you might be familiar. Some of you might be very familiar with Richard. He's been uh, a coach and mentor for me for a long time. And I know some of you as well. Um, you know, we took his bio that I could go on for like 10 or 15 minutes and we chopped it down and we chopped it down again. If you want to know a little bit more about Rich, we can certainly connect you with him later. But, you know, he's a co-founder and CEO of one of North America's top real estate training and coaching organizations. RRI, Richard Robbins International, has over 10,000 coaching grads, 300,000 real estate professionals who have attended RRI events and conferences worldwide since 1998. An international speaker, author and business coach. Rich Robbins' organization is designed to share the most advanced real estate business building systems with the world and armed with one goal, to help real estate agents build a business and a life they love. Thanks for being with us, Rich. All right, Jody, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Great job, buddy. Great job. Anyway, so good to be with you today. Um, we got a lot going on in real estate. So here's what I'm up to today. I want to give everybody an idea what I want to do. First of all, if we go back to March 2020, we all know what happened. The market dumped like crazy. And then we were, uh, we were sort of all wondering, probably everybody's a little bit scared for a few months, wondering what's going to happen with the market. Then all of a sudden, we hit about June and the market started to take off. And quite honestly, it took off like never before. I'm going to show you what I mean by that. But then since then, what has been happening in the industry is, you know, we have a lot of changes. Obviously, we had a budget recently last week. Uh, that is designed to slow the market to get more first-time buyers into the market. We've had two interest rate increases this year. We had a half a point yesterday. Um, so right now we have a lot going on. Obviously, interest rates are to deal with inflation. So here's what I want to do. Right now, I believe, at least when we talk to our clients, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market. Everybody's wondering, my God, what's going on? What's going to happen, right? Is this a real estate bubble? Is the market going to crash? Isn't the market going to crash? And of course, none of us know the perfect answer to that question. However, what I want to do is I want to arm you with really cool content that you can actually use with your clients. Because let's face it, the real estate business, the real estate market is going to get a lot of press over the next little while. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to be able to educate our prospects to help them make the best possible decision they can. And that's what I want to do with you today. So my goal is to take you through, and believe me, this is a lot of PowerPoint. I apologize for how much PowerPoint. I generally don't do this, but I want to make sure that I can show you all the different ways that you can communicate with buyers and sellers to help them make a better decision. At the end of the day, the value you bring to the marketplace is the difference between what it is your clients know and what you communicate to them they don't know. So when a client discovers something they did not know, they start to see value in you. And if they don't see value in you, then sometimes they're going, well, you know, man, why should I pay you that commission or what I should be working with you as a real estate agent? So I'm gonna bring up my PowerPoint here, everybody, and bear with me. It'll probably take me about 30 minutes or so to get, uh, to get through all of this. Uh, that should be it right there. And I'm going to uh, use my cursor to take you through a lot of this information. Um, so let's get this party started. So first of all, we all know last week there was a budget. Now I'm going to touch on the five to six points of the budget, just in case you haven't had a chance to see it. But remember, the liberal budget was designed to get more first time buyers into the market and to slow prices down. Now, as I get started, there's three numbers as a real estate sales professional that you need to truly understand. One, the number of sales that are taking place in your marketplace on a monthly basis. Now, the consumer, your buyers and sellers, they don't care about the number of sales. What they care about is prices. All the prices going up, prices going down, prices stable, right? But you have to worry about the number of sales because if last month you had this many sales and this next month you have this many sales, what happened? Your pie got smaller, which means there's less opportunities available to you as a salesperson. 
The second number you've got to know on a monthly basis is what's going on with prices. Now, you obviously care about prices, but that is what the consumer cares about. They want to know what's going on with prices. And the third number you got to know is called months of inventory, which is MOI, as we call it, months of inventory, because the first rule of economics, supply and demand, is going to determine which way your prices are going. So would it be possible for you to say, create a really cool graph where you could sit with the buyer and seller and you could show them the trend line with months of inventory so you could almost predict over the next few months which way your prices are going to move. And I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. So let's start with the budget. Number one, we have a foreign buyer's ban. In other words, people from any country other than Canada, foreign buyers, cannot buy a house in Canada. Now, there are exceptions to that. You can see some of the exceptions if you know, you're a permanent resident here, you're a foreign worker, you're a student, and there's a few other exceptions. But basically, what they're trying to do is take the competition away and only have people within Canada buying homes here. Will that slow the market? I don't know, maybe a little, but not that much. Obviously, we got a tax-free savings account for first-time buyers where they can save up to $40,000. Um, they can save $8,000 a year for five years, get up to $40,000. Uh, is $40,000 going to make a tremendous difference in the market? Not convinced. You know, go to the big cities like Vancouver or Toronto, $40,000 is a deposit check, if you really think about it. Uh, speculation a tax. A little, yes? a little bit of context on that one. I think the government's hoping that you're going to invest and that's going to grow, right? Like your RSP at TFSA. So maybe... Maybe 40 turns into 80 eventually when these yes. people, you know, if you start saving early at a, at a high school, college kind of thing. Yes. Good point. Thank I you. So. Yeah. Thanks, Jody. Uh, speculation tax. So obviously, if somebody is buying a house and selling it within 12 months, they're now going to be taxed on that. Um, again, will it make a tremendous difference in the marketplace? I don't know. Home Buyers Bill of Rights. This one's sort of interesting. We've been talking for a while about blind bidding. And you look at that and you say, well, you know, should, should all buyers know what all of the other offers are? And we could debate that back and forth. I'm a fan of transparency. Uh, however, this has got to be passed at a provincial level, which could be difficult. So some provinces might do it, some may not. Uh, but anyway, I'm personally a fan of transparency. I think the more transparency there is in what it is we do as a profession, uh, probably, probably the more professional we look. And then, of course, we've also got, whoops, sorry, we've also got doubling the uh, first-time home buyer tax credit, okay? All good for first-time buyers, obviously. And then the last one is the housing accelerator fund, which to me, if done properly, could have the largest impact in the market because Canada is short of housing. There's no question about that. We've got to get land uh, to development quicker. We've got to get the cost of approvals and permits down. So we'll see how this all works out. But that's just a very quick overview. Um, if you want to know more about that, you can read up on that. But here's what I want to do. I want to take you back. I want to talk to the last couple of years, and then I want to move forward into the next few years and see where is our market going. Have a look at some of these numbers, everybody. These are, what just happened here? I don't know why my PowerPoint's not working very well. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these numbers. These numbers are absolutely crazy. So if you can see my cursor here, this is the amount of sales that took place in Canada uh, since 2012. Now let's go to 2021 last year. That's 668,000 homes sold, that's units. Now, if you want to get into ends, double that because there's two ends to every unit. So if you look at 668,000 homes sold, and then you go the year before was 552,000, obviously you can see the two biggest years in Canada's history happened in 21 and 20. And you got to remember in 20, we had a few pretty slow months there because of COVID. So that's quite amazing what's going on. So the question is, can it keep up at this pace? And I'm going to suggest it can. It just can't continue to go at this pace. We go back to 2016, where there's 540,000 sales, the third best month, okay, in Canada's history. But if you look at it, you say, what would be a good trend line? 
you know, I would say a good trend line is around 500,000 sales per year. It's probably a pretty good trend line that we should consider. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this. If we look at those numbers from 2020 and 2021, if we compare over the last two years, in the last two years, sales units are up 36%. Now, let's put this in perspective. That means you had 36% more opportunities, didn't you? Because the pie was getting bigger, you see what I'm saying? So the pie was like here in 2019, the pie goes to here, way more sales, more opportunities for you, more buyers, more sellers, which means technically you should all be doing more business. You see what I'm saying? And then of course we go to 2021 and the pie got bigger again. So the question I would ask, is your business up by 36% just based on sales volume? Because let's reverse that. And this is where I think it's really important if you reverse it. If our pie was this big last year, there's 2021. And let's say our pie is going to go down, which I suspect it will. If you look at March sales opposed to March sales of last year, they were down, okay? Every market was a little bit different, but they were definitely down. Now saying that, it was still a very good March, but compared to last year, it was down. Like in Toronto, March of this year was the third best March in history, but the numbers were down by 30% from March of the year before. Think about those numbers, right? You're going to be down by 30% and we ended up having the third best March ever in history. So what we have to realize is the sales numbers, the number one number we got to know is that they're probably going to start to shrink, which means for you to do the same amount of business, you probably got a little bit better at what it is you do. And we'll talk more about that later. So understand that what's happening is 2021, we're probably going to start to see this number in 2022 become a little smaller. And we might be back down to what we did in 2020, maybe a little less than that. So there's going to be less opportunities available. Now, have a look at this. This is a graph of the sales that have taken place since 2019. Now, if you watch my cursor here, I'm on 2019. So you see how 2019 in Canada, we were doing you know, roughly 40,000 units a month. You can see that number? Pretty good trend line, right? 40,000 units a month. Now, if we're doing 40,000 units a month, that's about 500,000 units per year. Remember I said, when I look at the old trend line, I said 500 is a good number to bank on, right? So then what happened in 2020? You can see here we started 41,000 units. Of course, what happened here? COVID, boom, down, right? And then all of a sudden we start to recover a little bit. And then what happened? We went above what we did in 2019 right here. But look what continued to happen. The market went crazy, insane. Multiple offers, no inventory, right? 22 offers, we're dealing with offer dates. We're dealing with buyers that are getting frustrated. Buyers are scared. They don't know what to do to get themselves a house. The sellers think they just won the bloody lottery, but then the seller wants to move, but they can't sell because they can't find anything. So they're going, yeah, we consider selling, but guess what? We don't know where we're gonna go. And it's got absolutely wonky, right? Crazy marketplace. You know, dealing with less than two months of inventory in Ottawa, down sometimes less than one month of inventory. Absolutely insane what was going on. So look what happened. The market keeps going up here, see? And it ends in December. Can you believe that December did more volume than November or October? Just think about that. That generally doesn't happen. Let's go to 2021. Look where we start. 60,000 sales. We get up to 66. Now, here's what's interesting. And this most people didn't don't realize is actually March of last year was when the market started to slow down. So everybody goes, oh, it's this year. No, it was March of last year because look what happened. All of a sudden, you can see right here what happens to our market. It was down to 58, 55, which is still above the 10-year average, by the way. Okay, but still you can go down, down with a little bump here, right? And then of course we end up here at 54,000 sales. What ha what's happening this year? Look at this. We started below last year. We're at 58. Korea has not released the numbers for March yet. They usually come out around the 20th, but I'm going to suspect what we're going to see is this number is going to start going like that right there. Okay. So from a real estate sales professional standpoint, what exactly does this mean to you? This means that your pie is probably going to get smaller. There's not going to be as many buyers. There's not going to be as many sellers. So in other words, for you to do the same amount of business, if you have a smaller pie, a smaller sales pie, 
for you to do the same business, you got to take a bigger piece of that smaller pie. Y'all with me there? Okay, so that's where you got to think about this. So let's look at this next number. These are prices. Look at the prices across Canada. Can you believe we're 2020, 542, 677, and we go to 816,000, the average price in Canada. Absolutely insane. So look at this. That's a 51% increase in price in two years. Now, let's think about it from a salesperson perspective. If you're charging the same commission as you were two years ago, which hopefully you are or more, that means that if prices went up 51%, your GCI, your gross commission income should have went up what? 51%. Y'all with me here? Our sales were up by 36%, which means there was way more opportunities in the last two years. And our price is up by 51%, which means naturally our commission should have went up by 51%, plus we had more sales opportunities. So when you look at these numbers, if you're having a really great year, that's wonderful. But if you've been struggling over the last couple of years, then you need to change the way you're doing business. You got to start to work on your skills and your mindset because it is going to get a little more difficult. There's no question about that. Do I think the bottom's going to fall out? No, but it's definitely going to get a little more difficult. So here's some numbers I want to go through with you because my personal opinion is the bottom is not falling out of the market. We are going to have softer sales. We're going to have the market normalize, okay? You know, we're not going to have prices going up at 20 or 25% a year. I'm, I'm pretty confident in that. This is just my opinion, who ultimately knows. But here's why the Canadian real estate market is in great shape long term. Number one, we have 400,000 immigrants coming in here every year. That is the highest of the G7 nations. Number two, we have the largest wealth transfer taking place in Canadian history. What a wealth transfer is, it's where an older generation, maybe I'm a baby boomer, or the generation above me, the silent generation, they're transferring their money to millennials or the Gen X, right? So they're transferring their money to younger people. At one time, what a lot of people did is they wait until they passed on before their kids would get the money or their relatives or whatever it is. But now they're saying, we got to help these people. So 30% of first-time buyers are getting a gift in Canada from somebody, their parents, their relatives, whoever it is. 10% of move-up buyers are getting a gift, which means people can afford to buy real estate, which obviously they have if we had 668,000 sales. Interest rates are going to continue to rise. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think interest rates will continue to rise for the rest of 2022 and maybe into 2023. And that will definitely start to slow down the market. However, interest rates, even though they're going up, they're still at historical low levels. Look at this right here. There's your, there's your rate right there. That's your, uh, that's your prime rate. So we're sitting down here and you can see it just went up a little bit recently. But look at these numbers. You know, that's a five-year you know, conventional mortgage sort of thing. You're locking in. But look at here. I bought my very first house right here, everybody. 17 and three quarters percent was my mortgage right? I made $53,800 for a brand new house when I was 21 years old. Right there is when I bought it. So you got a pretty good idea how old I am. But anyway, so then you can see they went down. But look at this. If we go historically, like people that have been in real estate for five years, they don't understand rates can be here. Rates can be here. Like rates can go up to 8%. Now I know it sounds like crazy to even think about if you've only been in real estate, but I've been in real estate since I was 24 years old. Like I've worked in these crazy markets where we have high rates. I remember 1989, February of 1989. I'll never forget as long as I live. It was like somebody turned the tap off and the phone stopped ringing. It was a crazy thing. And we end up having a tough market for five years. I used to meet with people and I used to have to tell them that their house was worth less than their mortgage. And then I would have to go to the bank and try to negotiate with the bank because otherwise, how was I going to get paid? Right? Because, you know, they're not going to discharge the mortgage, which means we couldn't sell the house. In some cases, I didn't get paid. It got really crazy. Do I think that's going to happen? Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is we've got to realize that no matter what is going on right now, if rates went up two points, they're still at historical low levels. Look at this. Interest rates are going to continue to rise. No question about that. This was in the Financial Post. And these are numbers you should be talking to buyers and sellers about. That's why I'm giving you this information. 
Nationally, we have 426 units per thousand people. 426 units per thousand people. That is the lowest in the G7 nations. France has the highest at 540. So what does that tell you? Ladies and gentlemen, we got a housing shortage. In Canada, we have a housing shortage. We need to build more homes. If I go back to you know, that accelerator in the budget that said their plan is to build 100,000 homes in the next five years. Well, let me show you something. Canada, according to Scotia Bank, is short 1.8 million. 1.8 million homes. Yeah. 660,000 in Ontario. And they're trying to build 100,000 in the next five years. I'm going, that's not solving our problem, folks. We have a housing shortage. Now, saying that, the housing shortage is what will make our market strong over the next five or 10 years. Does that mean we won't have a slowdown over the next six to 12 to 18 months? No, because we can still be affected by interest rates, you see? So we gotta realize that that's why I don't think the bottom's gonna fall out because we get two different forces working here. We got the government trying to slow it down. We got interest rates going up. But on the other hand, at the end of the day, we're still short in terms of housing. So I think it's going to be just fine long term, but I think we're going to have a turbulent few years. Okay, so let's get into the five stages of a market. So remember, two numbers I already talked about, number of sales and average price. Third one is months of inventory. And this number here is something you need to study, you need to understand, and you need to own. Price is determined by months of inventory, which simply follows what? Supply and demand. Low supply, high demand, prices will go up. High, we got lots of demand, low supply, prices go down. Or high supply, prices go down. So here's how you figure out months of inventory. Now, if you've been following me, if you've been watching my market update videos, I talk about this all the time because this is how you predict your marketplace right here. If you wanna get some idea as to where the market's going, you gotta understand this. So you look at it and you say, how do you determine months of inventory? Really simple, take active listings, at the end of the month. And you can do that for your Ottawa real estate board. You can do it for all of Canada if you want. You can do it for whatever market you want. Just go to your local real estate board and get these numbers. Active listings at the end of the month, the sales, the total sales, and you divide the sales into the listings, gives you months of inventory. Example, we got 10,000 active listings. Now remember, don't use new listings. Your inventory is active listings. 10,000 active listings at the end of the month, we divide that by 5,000 sales that took place that month. That means we've got two months of inventory, okay? Now, what does that mean? That means if you didn't list another house, you can go two months before you run out of inventory. If you have two months of inventory, I want you to think about this for a moment. If you have two months of inventory, what are the chances of a house selling in 30 days? 50%, because you get 10,000 listings, you only have 5,000 sales, which means 5,000 did not sell. So that means you got a 50% chance of selling. If you got one month of inventory, everything's selling, multiple offers and everything, market's out of control. Balanced market, four to six months of inventory, okay? Balanced. If you're below four months of inventory, you got a seller's market. Above six months of inventory, you got a buyer's market where prices are weakening. Prices are stable four to six months. So if you have three months of inventory, think about it for a moment, what are the chances of a house selling every month? 33%. You got four months of inventory. What's the chance of a house selling? 25%. So we've been operating with under two and sometimes under one. That's where our market's been operating, which means it's been absolutely out of control. So here's what I want to take you through. And this, this here is something you should be talking to buyers and sellers about. Help them understand how the stages of a market work. So what we did is we created this visual. Now, these are five stages of a market right here. Now, right now, you have been in three. Market's been crazy. But where does it start? It starts down here at six months of inventory, which remember, right in here is your balance market, right? And then we start to move into seller's market. And the more we go this way, right here, the faster prices are going up, right? And the quicker homes are selling. So you've been sitting up here, right around here, with one less than one, just over one month of inventory. So I wanna show you the characteristics because we're moving this way, everybody, right now. This is the way we're going, right down here. Some markets have already achieved four. 
Some markets, especially in British Columbia, are getting close to five. So let me show you the characteristics. So stage number one, obviously we have what? Less than five months of inventory. Low number of showings, signs of the market increasing. So this is when we're coming up. Things are starting to come out of a balanced market and move into a more active market. Strategy for buyers and buyer's agents, they have lots of inventory, lots to choose from. They have strong negotiating power and conditions are gonna be in almost all offers. Strategies for sellers, price and condition are the key. Because think about this, if you have five months of inventory, what are the chances of selling? 20% every month, right? 20%. One in five are going to sell, which means when you have a listing and that listing goes to market, what's happening is you can say to a seller, we right now have five months of inventory and don't tell them what you can show them. You need to show them the evidence so they have confidence in what you're saying. We have five months of inventory right now, which means one out of five homes are selling every month, which means when we go to market, we have to figure out how to be the one out of the five to sell. So what we can do is we can be the one that helps one of the other ones sell, or we can use our competition to help us sell, which means we better be good with our price and we better be in damn good condition. Okay, so that's, that's the beginning as the market starts to move up. And then we go to stage two, which is right here. We get to stage two, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see your less than three months of inventory. And signs are the inventory keeps going down, increased showings. You might have some competing offers on like wow homes, like, you know, ones that show really well. They're emotionally when you walk in and they got a great location. Strategy for buyers, you have sufficient inventory, but prices are starting to go up faster than buyers believe. So when you're in stage two, you have trouble getting buyers to make an offer that will win because they don't get it yet right? Like how many times have you worked with a buyer that lost two or three times before they finally figured it out, what they got to do, right? Happened all the time. Conditions and offer are still acceptable, but your negotiating power is going to decrease and you will start to see non-conditional offers. You have to list at fair market value based on the features and you still have the home in good condition if you want to get multiples, okay? So then we move to stage three, where we have been sitting since June of 2020, and we're starting to move this way. Stage three, I probably don't have to explain it to you. Less than two months of inventory, multiple showing, multiple offers, no conditions. You got offer dates, you got 22 offers, 159,000 offers, you get 12 offers. It's insane, right? You know, like everybody's fighting for that one house. You got 22 offers, you got one winner, and you got 21 losers. You got 21 frustrated buyers, 21 frustrated real estate agents. That's not a fun market to work in, right? If you really think about it. Not only that, you're probably working too much. You're probably tired. You're probably worn out as an agent because the market is just absolutely tiring. Now we're starting to go this way, everybody. We're over here. So now you got to listen closely. So when you get over into four, which Ottawa is moving in that direction, Ottawa will move slower than some other provinces, okay? Because the city is a very active city. So I think it's going to move slower than British Columbia. I think Ontario overall will probably move slower into four than British Columbia. Alberta, Saskatchewan, I think the market is going to remain fairly buoyant. I think they're going to have the best market this year because of oil prices. Okay. So you're going to move to number four. And then we're what? Three plus months of inventory. Now, three plus months of inventory, 33% chance of selling. These are the conversations you got to have with buyers and sellers. Showings are steady, wow factor homes will still get multiple offers, okay, but not okay homes. You're going to see less offer dates. You might even be seeing that now, okay? Strategy for buyers and buyer's agent. Buyers may get a better deal on a less ideal home. So, you know, a house that's rough isn't getting multiple offers. Buyers might be able to get a deal on those now. You might see some price reductions right on home. Strategies, you know, for sellers. Price and presentation are the key. The house has got to show really well. You got to price it properly, especially if you're interested in multiples or in sometimes interest in getting it sold. And then five, you know, we go back into five. You can see what's going on. Now we get above four months of inventory. So in a nutshell, what I have shown you is I've shown you the numbers of sales that have taken place, where we think they're going to go. I've shown you the prices. I don't think prices are going to go down, but they're sure as hell not going up at 20 or 25 points a year. 
Like I'm, I'm very sure of that. Maybe the, the end of this year, they'll have gone up what? Seven points, 10 points. I don't know. Nobody knows for sure, but I don't think it's going to be 25 points, right? Because interest rates are going to cool the market and they're putting interest rates up to deal with inflation because inflation is really high. Like think about everything you buy, go buy some steaks right now. Are you kidding me? Right, go buy a car right now. You can't get one. Like this is insane, right? So they're charging a fortune. So we got inflation. House prices going up, cause inflation. So I think what we all got to do is realize the market is going to change. The market is going to be fine. However, your pie is going to get smaller. So which means you got to get a little better at what it is you do. Now, here's what I've done for you. I sat this morning and like Matt and Jody put a lot of pressure on me in this presentation. They said, Rich, like, we want some good shit here today, okay? So I said, okay. So what I did was I thought, when a market starts to change and people start to become a little uncertain about it, some people get a little scared inside. And I understand that, right? We all do. We all want things to remain good. And I suspect they will. It's just going to be a little different. But what we have to understand is that at the end of the day, you know, what are we really owed? Right? In other words, what are we entitled to and what does the world owe us? And what I did was I put together a comprehensive list for you of what we're entitled to and what the world owes us. And there it is right there. You worked all morning for that? I worked all morning. It's pages long, Jody. You can see the pages behind it, it's right? Amazing. It's amazing. This is a truly amazing work of art. I know. That's a work of art. So here's my thinking, buddy. My thinking is this. My thinking is that Every single person that is on here right now, you have the ability to respond to any market. And that's called response ability. And what I'm trying to say to you is don't fear the market. The market's fine. Don't fear your future. Because I have worked in every possible market you could work in, in real estate, right? Telling people that their mortgage is more than their house is worth. You know, spending three weeks negotiating with a bank before I can list a home for sale. I've dealt in busy markets. I've been in real estate since 24. And I've always, always done well. Now, the reason I believe that I did well is because I was always analyzing what was going on in the market. And I was bringing the dialogues. Remember, change your words, change your worth in real estate. You need to be able to have powerful conversations with people as the market starts to adjust. You need to be able to show them what it is they don't know. So they go, wow, I didn't know that. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, I didn't know that. That's your job. Because here's what a salesperson's job is. Salesperson's job is to give people all the information you can possibly give them to help them make an educated informed decision. That is your job. People want to make the right decisions, but they sometimes make the wrong decisions because maybe they didn't have all the information. So you have to become what I call a valuable resource to the public. Just like I have to become a valuable resource to real estate sales professionals being in the coaching and training business. Which means all of this content that I just shared with you, this is a type of stuff that you've got to start creating for yourself and have it specific to the Ottawa market or whatever market you're in. Like, let's face it, Toronto numbers are great, but you're better if you have numbers that represent the geographic layer you're operating in. When the market starts to change, the great agents will do better. They will, they'll do better because they become sought after. You know what I mean? People now can't just list with their second cousins, brothers, uncles, friends, girlfriend, right? Because it doesn't matter who I list with, my house is going to sell anyway. That doesn't start to happen anymore, which means that top 10% or top 5%, the cream rises to the top. But what you have to do is you got to make sure that you're building your confidence, you got to be building, okay, the information, you got to be studying, know what's going on in the market and know how to deal with it. So I want to uh, tell you quickly, and then I'm going to turn this back over to Matt and Jody and see if there's any questions. We have an event, exciting coming up. It's a virtual event, it goes from 11 to 5 Eastern time, May 4th and 5th. 
Um, I know the boys here that host this have been to many of these. It's called Ideas in Action Mastermind. So here's the deal with this event. With the market changing, I am super concerned about trying to get the right marketing ideas, the right sales ideas, the right mindset ideas to agents as the market starts to shift. So what we're going to talk about is what's working, what's not working, and what's next. And here's what we do. We have all kinds of cool presenters. Uh, Daria Kark, you might know Daria. She's in your marketplace. Uh, she's going to be there. You know, she's getting over a 20% return on her database. So she got a few hundred people in her database, 250 people in her database, doing 50 deals just from her database. She's going to teach you how to do that. We got Faisal coming in. If you know Faisal, he is the number one individual agent in Remax, not team, individual agent. This guy's doing hundreds of deals by himself. Yes, he's got a couple of assistants, but no other agents. It's insane. So he's going to come in and talk to you about that. We got Storm Fletcher. She's a VP of sales with her company. She's going to talk about sales strategy. I don't know. There's some guy in the bottom left. I don't know who that is, but he's going to be there as well. And then we got Elaine Shin coming in. She's actually my personal doctor. I'm, I'm in, you know, executive health center. And what she's going to talk about is how to deal with burnout. Because a lot of people have been tired over the last couple of years. And then uh, we got Jeff coming in. Uh, he's from Vancouver, Bridge, Columbia, actually the North Shore. He's going to talk about five technologies that will save you lots of time. And these are just a few. We're going to have all kinds of presenters at this event. They're all short presentations. And here's how it works, everybody. We present you with the idea. So every presenter will say, here's the idea. And what they'll do second is say, and here's the result this idea has gotten me. And then they'll teach you exactly how to execute it. Then after they've shown you the how to do it, then we brainstorm in the chat and say, add on to the idea. How can we make the idea better? How would you do it, right? So not only do you learn from the stage, you're going to learn from the chat. And it goes from 11 till 5 each day, and you're going to walk out with more ideas than you could ever use. You actually have to narrow it down to the best ideas for you. So here's the deal. Uh, ideas in action, 4th and 5th, 11 to 5 both days. <clears throat> Ticket regular price is $398. Again, Matt and Jody uh, squeezed me here. So we got it. Uh, 197 will be your price. But let me tell you how to register because there's a few things you got to figure out. Number one, registration link in the chat. Dana Stroud is on. Storm Fletcher is on. They'll put the link right in the chat for you. You can click on that. Perfect. Or you can take a picture right now of the QR code. However, when you go into the QR code, you're going to have to type in save 100. Okay. So you have to put in SAVE100, all caps, and it will reduce the price to the 197 or you're welcome to call the office. And I do want to say, not only will you get a ticket to the event, but we're actually going to send you um, a number of little gifts that you're going to love. I'm not even going to tell you what they are, but I can tell you this. The gifts that we're going to send you are worth double the ticket price. Double the ticket there price. It will be a wonderful surprise. Okay, so that's all I got. Guys, Jody and uh, Matt, thank you for having me today. And I hope everybody enjoyed the presentation. And I don't know if you get any questions, but yeah, I will yeah, stay on as long as- stick around? Uh, yes. Me, okay, so we'll take some questions. First of all, you know, uh, thanks again for um, the extra squeeze on, the, on the, your uh, registration. I've seen it as low as maybe $100 off. I've not seen it at that price advertised anywhere. So uh, anybody from Ottawa or on the call right now, you know, take advantage of that. That's super good value. And I guess, you know, while we're thinking about changing markets, yes, you know, it's the people uh, and agents with recommendations that get caught in the middle, you know, when the tides go in the other way. And, you know, for, do you have any other tips about how to recognize the signs you know, to help people with the transition because, you know, eventually you're on the wrong side of these things, or you could be, I guess, without really being thoughtful about it. You know, you've been through this scenario before, you know, land some stuff on us here. Okay. Number one, and I know a lot of people aren't numbers people. I happen to be a numbers guy. So I study numbers and I like to know markets. You must understand your market numbers every month. Like Ottawa probably releases their numbers by what the fifth of the month, I'm going to say. Yeah. Every month. Um, yeah. And what I would say to them all is I would, some of these, you know, graphs that I showed you, I would say that they should actually create them for Ottawa and, you know, the line graphs and you can start, you know, adding to it every month, what's going on with your numbers, because not only will that show you, so the, the three numbers that I would have, I would have a line graph of the number of sales each month. 
That would be number one, because that shows you which way your market's trending. The second graph I would have is a line graph of the prices every month, average price, because that shows you which way it's trending. And the third, I would have a line graph of the months of inventory. Now you could put all these on the same graph. And then what I would do, I would update that every month, right, for the next month. And what that's going to show you is what direction that, that market is going. And then once you know what direction it's going, you can take the content here and look at say what stage of the market we're at and decide how you need to be pricing properties. How do you need to be working with buyers? What sort of conversations do you need to have to help them make a decision? Because you'll become invaluable in a changing market. You become invaluable to buyers and sellers because they don't know what the hell's going on. Amazing. We've got a question here from Tim Barber. Mm -hmm. Tim Barber in Kingston. He asks, does Richard have any comments or strategies for realtors who are anticipating increased competition from market disruptors? Uh, he goes on to ask, you know, such as auction companies, uh, blah, 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 blah. But, but I think there, that we face more than just an auction company or two. We face, you know, outside competition. We face, uh, you know, the stuff from the government. So how do we, how do we deal with that? Yeah, it's, you know, it's something I've been watching really closely because first of all, I'm in the US right now, I'm in Florida. So I spend my winters down in Florida and I do, you know, I do a lot of business in Florida as well as Canada, but they have more disruption down here than we do in Canada. So I'm sure you're all familiar with iBuyers, right? You know, where they just, they buy your house, right? You know, send it in on the internet and they'll make you an offer in your house and they'll close in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever the hell you want. They're called iBuyers. And the biggest one is Open Door, which is based in Arizona. So I've been watching that really closely. And there's, there's a whole bunch of those. Obviously, you know, some companies are starting to do it at a corporate level as well. And then, you know, in Canada, we seem to have pockets of disruptors. You know what I mean? Like, you don't really see a lot of Canada-wide disruptors yet. You see a pocket, maybe something doing Ottawa, somebody doing something here. Um, but here's the way I look at the real estate industry. The real estate industry is a relationship business. And what Daria Kark will be teaching at this event, and by the way, I, I should have told you that price is good till midnight tonight, okay? So, uh, but after that, uh, it goes to regular price, but we need to double down on relationships. So in other words, we need to develop relationships. We need to create a database of people, okay? And then that database of people that we call the lifetime referral system, we need to become their resource center for more than real estate. We need to be a resource center when they're thinking about renewing their mortgage. We need to be a resource center when they're thinking about building a fence. You know what I mean? Where we, we are like the hub that goes out to all of these people that you can help them with anything to do with their home. Because you all know contractors and fences and pavers, right? And our lifetime referral system is based around that because giving starts the receiving process. And if we go out into the world and if we give more than we get, the day will come when we get more than we give. And I believe so much in that. I built this whole company based on that, right? But what happens in this world is because of technology and because of internet leads, everybody thinks, oh, that's the new way. You don't need relationships anymore. No, we need relationships today more than ever before, right? So that we don't have to worry about that person that is an advocate of ours going to somebody else because they call us. They just pick up the phone and phone you. You're the one. You're their agent, not the agent, right? So my sort of big kick, and I know I got passionate about this, but I just can't believe that people are still not understanding the power of relationships, the power of creating a database, right, in a CRM, and then bringing value to those people in the database, not just when they're a buyer or seller, but the whole time they're a homeowner. So you own the relationship because when you own the relationship right then i don't have to worry about any of those others this is like a back to basics tune-up right this is the stuff this i can take the the conference book from 2000 and something i'm sure 100%. i would open it up and you you've you know you've said that to me before just like this right and it's and that's what i mean like it's sort of gone full circle well or it's so more important now than ever before in history and the other thing we have to remember is even with Open Door in Arizona, that is probably the strongest iBuyer state in the US, they're still only controlling 6% of a market. Right. So I, I believe that 
disruptors, unless something really crazy comes along that I don't understand, will always be less than 10% of a marketplace, which leaves us 90%. I think that's okay. Yeah. And, and I truly believe that as there's more uh, options for a consumer, they're going to need a trusted professional to help analyze them and to, to help choose a path, right? They're 100%. Gonna, so. Um, I'm coming up with this new concept, by the way, well, you'll, you'll hear it at the next event if you guys are there. It's called Trusted Advisor for Life. And I'm, I'm sort of thinking about this concept that what we have to position ourselves as that trusted advisor for life, right? So that anything to do with home ownership, they'll reach out to you and see if there's some way you could help. So, so let's pretend I'm, I'm an agent that's been in the business maybe like three, four, five years. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of I'm stagnant maybe in, in the sales that I've done. And, and I, I know I'm, I'm conscious of the time that we've got. So, but what, what's one thing that I could do, you know, and, and you just went in on relationships and I, and I think that should, was probably going to be your answer, but something else, what is something that I can do to get past that kind of stagnant place? Skill development. You got, you got to develop your skills, right? Like, you know, you think about, we're salespeople. So you go, well, we're salespeople. You know, and sales to me is serving. That's why I look at sales, right? You're serving other people. You're helping people make decisions. So my question is, how often does that agent that's stagnant work on their dialogues? Like, you know, so here's an example. Somebody says to you, hey, I want you to cut your commission." right? A lot of people struggle with that. And I, I might say something like this. There's many ways to handle. I might say, uh, I understand, you know, you want to probably get, you know, the best commission you possibly can, but just let me ask you, if you don't mind, um, are you more interested in the lowest commission or do you want to net the most amount of money out of your house? Now, what I did by saying that was I got them thinking about net a little bit, right? And they might say, I want both. And you can say, that's okay. But say at the end of the day, the reason you're asking me to cut because you want to get more net, right? Out of your house. And they go, that's right. Well, let me show you by working with me how you're actually going to net more money. And then you have, you know, whatever the list to sale ratio is, right? Of your marketplace opposed to your list to sale ratio, which hopefully is 2% higher if you're a good negotiator, if you're a great agent. And so what you've done is you've completely got them thinking differently by asking, by asking what I call leading questions. Now that's just one example. Like there's, there's a million conversations like that. And the whole way you start to get better at what you do is to figure out a way how to make more money in less time. That's always the secret. How do you make more money in less time? Well, guess what? You got to take advantage of more opportunities. How do you take advantage of more opportunities, develop your skills? So you're, when you're having a conversation, you're getting more appointments. When you're on appointments, you're getting the listing, you're getting the buyer, you're getting the, the house when you have multiple offers. So, you know, mindset's obviously big. I always go mindset and skill development are the two biggies, right? And, you know, skill development, man, get trained, get trained, get trained, get trained, get trained, get better at what you do. Awesome. Uh... I don't know. I think we'll, Kendra, we'll answer your, your question after the fact. You asked where on Tread can we find the uh, list sale price ratio? Just, uh, I think you just got to do the math or, or speak to your uh, broker of uh, record probably. It's probably the best one. Yeah. But, uh, but Richard, <laughs> this has been amazing. Uh, I know, I knew that we, this was going to be amazing when we chatted with you yesterday. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in a few weeks at your, uh, your virtual session. And Thank you so much for the time you spent with us today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for your support, guys. I, you know, I, I know you come out to the events and, and, and uh, involved in coaching. I just appreciate all your support as well. We we'll look forward to seeing you in May. Okay, I look forward awesome. to it. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.